up already. I'm not getting up. Ugh, I have to get up. I have to go to work. I don't want to go to work. I hate work. I could call off, but that means actually picking up the phone and talking to someone. It's easier if I just don't show up. But then they'll call, and that'll make me anxious because I'll have to ignore it because I didn't go to work and I have no logical reason why I didn't go to work and I can't lose another job because I didn't show up. I, I can't fuck this up. Fuck. I guess I'll just go to work. Maybe today's the day I kill myself. Uh, I can't do that to my family. Besides, what if I try and don't die? I hate my life. Why am I here? Why is life so painful? Part 1. Capitalist Realism in 1992, following the collapse of the Soviet Union, Francis Fukuyama declared the end of history. He claimed we had reached the end point of mankind's ideological evolution and the universalization of Western liberal democracy as the final form of human government. Quite a claim. It has now been over a generation since the fall of the Berlin Wall, meaning that most kids today, in fact, most adults today, have no idea what it even means to live in a world with an option other than capitalism. 30 years ago, the concern was that neoliberal logic was beginning to seep into the consciousness of unwitting spectators. But now, capitalist logic is all there is. It's not even questioned anymore. Mark Fisher calls this capitalist realism, the ambient, all-pervasive atmosphere where it's just sort of implied that capitalism is all there is. It conditions how we view the world, how we work, our social relations, even our thoughts and behaviors. So what I want to discuss today is the way capitalist realism informs our conversations and experiences of mental health. Mexi and I actually talked about this on her podcast, The Vegan Vanguard, last summer. So if you like this video and want to hear more, you can check that out. I'll leave the link in the description below, along with a bunch of other resources on the topic. So when it comes to capitalist realism and mental health, I think a useful framework for understanding this is Lacan's concept of the real versus reality. The real being that which is objectively real or true, and reality being that which presents itself as real or true. Reality is pure ideology, but acts as if it is non-ideological, and in turn actually ends up covering up and suppressing what is truly real. So when it comes to mental health, we are taught to believe that mental illness is this natural fact of life, purely a chemical biological imbalance in the brain which requires a chemical solution. This is reality in Lacan's analysis. What is missing and in fact being actively covered up is the very real social, political, and economic causes which contribute to mental illness and which always seem to be missing from the equation. It goes without saying that all mental illnesses are neurologically instantaneous, but this says nothing about their causation. If it is true, for instance, that depression is constituted by low serotonin levels, what still needs to be explained is why particular individuals have low serotonin. This requires a social and political explanation, and the task of repoliticizing mental illness is an urgent one if the left wants to challenge capitalist realism. The way mental illness is currently framed places responsibility solely on the individual. The same thing goes for addiction. It says you, the individual, are the problem. You are sick. You own this illness. You own this addiction, right? 
Framing it in this way perpetuates capital's crusade towards individualism, separation, and atomization, and provides the perfect landscape for Big Pharma to peddle its pills as the magic cure to fix all these sick people. The global depression drug market is a $15 billion industry, and the global opioid market is expected to reach $42 billion by 2021. By privatizing and depoliticizing stress in this way, we need never consider that maybe the world in which we live in is the problem. The solution to the larger mental health and addiction epidemic then becomes reduced to public awareness campaigns and working towards destigmatization, both of which serve the function of funneling people straight into individualized medicine and therapy. Now, let me make this clear. I'm not saying that medicine or therapy are bad. I know firsthand that these things can be real lifesavers and serve a very real purpose. What I am saying, though, is that this can't be the only solution. We need to address the root cause of mental illness instead of just dealing with symptoms. And we need to consider the broader structural issues in place, which are causing perfectly sane people to become insane. In other words, we need to make mental health political. I was 14 when I was diagnosed with depression and anxiety. I went to a doctor who told me I had a chemical imbalance and prescribed me Prozac. I then became more suicidal than I had ever been before. I was taken off Prozac and put on Lexapro. It helped. A couple months later, it stopped helping. My dose was increased. Again, it worked and then stopped. Again, my dose was increased. I started self-medicating. I developed an eating disorder. I started cutting and I became a drug addict. I tried everything I could think of to numb the pain, to stop the thoughts that were telling me I'm not good enough and I couldn't understand why the pain wasn't going away. Part two, the broken brain. In 1972, a man named David Rosenhan sent a bunch of his graduate students into psychiatric hospitals all over the United States, instructing them to tell the staff they heard the word thud in their heads. And that's it. Every single one was falsely diagnosed with a mental illness of either bipolar disorder or schizophrenia and hospitalized. And they were only released after admitting to their diagnosis, agreeing to take the prescribed antipsychotic medication and pretending to get better. This was just one in a long series of embarrassments faced by the psychiatric industry at the time, casting doubt on the ability of psychiatrists to distinguish individuals with mental disorders from those without. At the same time, neoliberal ideology propagating individualism, rational thinking, and personal responsibility began to take hold. And both of these served as the impetus for a new model of mental health, one based on an objective checklist of symptoms called the third edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. Whereas before, psychiatry was based on the subjective opinions of human beings, now an objective diagnostic machine could properly and accurately diagnose mental disorder with ease. Suddenly, millions of people were diagnosing themselves based off these checklists and presenting at psychiatrist's office, requesting and receiving medication for their illness without providing any personal history. Conveniently enough, this was also the time when drug companies started pushing SSRIs, a class of drugs usually used to treat depression and anxiety by altering serotonin levels in the brain. There was just one problem. These supposedly objective checklists only looked at observable symptoms, as if they were this biological inevitability, characteristics of a broken brain, so to speak, completely leaving out the context in which these symptoms occurred. In other words, your baby could die tonight, and tomorrow you could be diagnosed with acute depression based on the diagnostic criteria and doped up on Xanax. 
Many leading psychiatrists at the time, including the creator of the DSM-3, Robert Spitzer, began to question the system's validity, arguing that psychiatric disorders were being confused with very normal responses to life's tribulations. Psychiatry was essentially pathologizing and medicalizing normal human emotions of sadness, grief, and anxiety, creating a static society in which humans are adjusted by medication to fit an agreed-upon normal type defined by the manual. And it was happening on a large scale. In the process, a new system of management was emerging. The drugs took away those complex and difficult feelings and made the individuals happier. But they also made them simpler beings, more easy to predict and manage, and closer to the machine-like creatures at the heart of the economic models. By using checklists of symptoms about emotions, you have gone out and confused normal human responses to, to life with mental disorder and therefore created an illusion of a vast epidemic. A medicalized illusion and obviously a situation where you medicalize is a situation where your focus will not be on social change, it will be on controlling individuals to fit in properly. That's, that's the subtle and overall danger here, that it could serve our kind of social economic systems needs in a way in which we become more, more efficient but less human. This supposedly objective system based on numbers was in fact simply reinforcing the main goals of neoliberalism. Concentration on the self as opposed to the community as the relevant site for change and improvement. It was also part of a larger project of control. Part 3. Societies of Control. In his work, Postscript on the Societies of Control, Gil Deleuze argues that we are no longer living in what Michel Foucault termed a disciplinary society, characterized by the enclosed spaces and confinement of the factory, schools, and the prison, but have instead shifted to a society of control, distinguished by more mobile and dispersed forms of governance, and complex systems of surveillance in which our every move is tracked and which we cannot escape. In a disciplinary society, the factory served to aggregate workers into one enclosed site of confinement, in which management could force them to conform and in which trade unions could organize. Now, in a society of control, the factory has become the corporation, organized to induce anxiety by pitting workers against each other and against themselves. Institutions are no longer these unchanging, self-containing molds which one must conform to, but instead modulations, continuously changing and spilling out of or transforming the mold. So for example, education is no longer confined to the school, and it is no longer this thing that you finish, but a continuous, prolonged process of lifelong learning. We will be forever taking classes to continue our education. There will always be one more seminar to attend, one more degree or certificate to be had. The prison system is no longer confined to individual cells or to the physical prison, but there is now prison inside your home in the form of ankle bracelets, which track your every move and make sure you stay in your box along with probation and parole, which ensure you stay tethered to the system for years or even decades. This societal shift coincided with the implementation of neoliberal ideology and post-Fordist production. Under Fordism, when you left work, you left work. Now, even though we're free from the constraints of the enclosed workspace, work is now free to follow us anywhere. We take work home with us, on the road with us, we're on call, expected to answer emails in a timely manner, even in our free time. We are under constant pressure to perform, constricted and controlled by target incentives, performance management, etc. And to make matters worse, underperformance at work is now considered a mental illness. 
See, capital relies on a highly productive, flexible workforce for profit, and so must continuously promote a culture of self-surveillance and self-improvement if it wants to remain profitable and in control. Focusing on individual performance in this way, instead of power imbalances in the workplace, psychiatry is able to depoliticize conflict and an increasingly alienating work environment. And by creating new categories of mental illness to diagnose oneself with, individuals problematize themselves rather than the broader organizational climate. But this isn't an individual problem, it's a societal one. To quote Fisher, as production and distribution are restructured, so are nervous systems. He goes on to discuss the work of Christian Marazzi, who has conducted research examining the correlation between increased rates of bipolar disorder and postfordism. If, as Deleuze and Guattari argue, schizophrenia is the condition that marks the outer edges of capitalism, then bipolar disorder is the mental illness proper to the interior of capitalism. With its ceaseless boom and bust cycles, capitalism is itself fundamentally and irreducibly bipolar, periodically lurching between hyped up mania, the irrational exuberance of bubble thinking, and depressive come down. The term economic depression is no accident, of course. To a degree unprecedented in any other social system, capitalism both feeds on and reproduces the moods of populations. Without delirium and confidence, capital could not function. Growing up, I always felt that my life lacked purpose. Uh, I remember as early as grade school thinking that something was just missing. Uh, I was depressed and anxious and lonely, and so I searched for a fix. I found comfort in excessive exercise, binging and purging, uh, self-mutilation, television, and eventually drugs and alcohol. At age 14, I took my first drink and my insecurities uh, immediately faded away. I was suddenly able to chat with boys. I immediately felt prettier, more confident, and for the first time in my life, I felt like I was truly myself. I then pursued that pleasure into oblivion. Uh, a decade later, I was a heroin junkie in and out of rehabs, jail, and waiting for death. This is not a particularly uncommon story. 20% of all teens will suffer depression before they reach adulthood. Almost 50% of high school seniors have abused a drug of some kind. And suicide is the third leading cause of death for 15 to 24 year olds. Usually depression is considered to be a state of anhedonia, characterized by the inability to achieve pleasure. Depressive hedonia, on the contrary, refers to the constant drive to seek out pleasure and nothing else. This was me. This also seems to be the teenage condition, maybe even the general condition of late capitalism. Kids are strung out on sugary foods, social media, Adderall, and Netflix, too agitated to focus, only interested in pursuing their next short-term fix because there is no longer any long-term, and adults aren't any better. Fisher suggests this is a result of the breakdown of traditional disciplinary systems, as I discussed before, and the push towards consumption as a way of life. In my last video, I discussed the ways our increasingly unequal and materialistic culture, in fact, cultivates insecurities, which ultimately drives mass consumption and fuels capital. This has led to a breakdown in our culture and individual psyche, where we shop to feel less isolated, Photoshop or abuse our bodies to feel more accepted, and consume psychedelics or opiates to feel more alive. Furthermore, capital in fact drives us to take on mediatized secondary identities, presented through public consumption and online personas which we must addictively maintain. Nothing about this life we live in is normal or natural or healthy. So what can we do? Part four, resistance as class struggle. 
According to every major statistical measure, the income gap between the rich and poor has been growing steadily around the world for more than 30 years. We've seen a shift from full-time to part-time zero hours contracts, outsourcing of capital and labor, and workers being expected to reskill frequently as they move from job to job, participating in this precarious and unstable gig economy that we now reside in. Society has transformed into this omnipresent system of control in which our traditional disciplinary institutions are breaking down and in decay. Family life has become disconnected, marriages broken. We are in and out of rehabs, in and out of prison, in and out of counseling, school and work. Nothing is stable. Precarity, anxiety, alienation and depression reign supreme and we need to do something different now at the very least we need to start reframing the way we talk about mental illness in a monthly review article titled capitalism and mental health david matthews stresses the importance of challenging the current biomedical model of mental illness which makes individuals solely responsible for their stress and instead suggests we implement a Marxist-inspired social model of mental health. To quote Matthews, the social model of disability identifies capitalism as instrumental to the construction of the category of disability, defined as impairments that exclude people from the labor market. Adopting a broadly materialist perspective, a social model of mental health addresses material disadvantage, oppression, and political exclusion as significant causes of mental illness. The National Survivor Network in England, Recovery in the Bin, and Kindred Minds are three organizations made up of people suffering from mental illness currently working to make this model a reality. I'll leave their links below if you want to check out their work. What all these groups have in common is that they are all coming forward to challenge the dominant biomedical framework and demanding something different. The thing is, we are all impacted by the callous and cruel conditions of capitalism. And until we come together in solidarity, nothing is going to change. I don't have all the answers, obviously. But I do know what it's like to suffer from what I considered to be a self-imposed crisis, but which was actually the exact opposite. I should add that there are obviously individual personal things that we can be doing to alleviate our suffering, right? Self-care is incredibly important. I personally find meditation, exercise, journaling, eating healthy, and most importantly, uh, community involvement and meaningful connections with people so, so important. Personal responsibility, if it wasn't so horribly co-opted by the right, I mean, I think is actually very important in my day-to-day -day life. However, however, personal responsibility is only as good as the environment in which it exists. And our environment is shit. The mental health epidemic really needs to be framed as part of the wider class struggle. Oppression, exploitation, and inequality greatly repress the true realization of what it means to be human. Opposing the brutality of capitalism's impact on mental well-being must be central to the class struggle, as the fight for socialism is never just one for increased material equality, but also for humanity in a society in which all human needs, including psychological ones, are satisfied. Finally, I'd just like to add, if you are suffering from mental distress of any kind, I just want you to know that you are absolutely not alone. Uh, I know what you're going through. So many people know what you're going through. Um, I'm going to leave a ton of resources in the description below if you guys want to learn more or if you need information on where to find help. Finally, I'd like to thank Angie Speaks, P.D. Morin, and Radical Reviewer for providing their voices for this video. Uh, go check out their channels. They're all great. So that's all I got for this video. Um, if you like it, give it a like, um, share, and subscribe. Um, and as always, I do love to hear your thoughts and comments, so please leave those below as well. And thanks so much for watching, guys.